Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about Diophantine equations. If you like this video, please comment, like, and subscribe, and hit the bell button for notifications. And let's get started. So, today we'll talk about some techniques, strategies, we'll look at some examples. Uh, first of all, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and history on Diophantus and Diophantine equations. So, Diophantus was, Diophantus was a Greek mathematician. He wrote three books. One of them is called Arithmetica, and Ferma studied his book and he wrote in the margin of that book, you know, that famous Fermat's Last Theorem, which was proven by Andrew Wiles recently, which is a very interesting equation. And the proof is obviously quite complicated and not a direct proof. Diophantus studied algebra at the time. Uh, it was avoided by many Greek mathematicians. So what is a Diophantine equation? Well, Diophantine equations are basically equations with integer solutions and most of the time, we have more unknowns than the number of equations, which makes them really interesting to solve. And sometimes we looked at Diophantine equations and Diophantine systems, you know, in our previous videos. You can go ahead and look at those as well. Okay, cool. So let's talk about some techniques. What are some of the techniques? The first and foremost technique for solving Diophantine equations is modular arithmetic. Modular arithmetic is a very powerful tool in number theory as well as in algebra. So the definition for mod n is basically a and b are congruent mod n if and only if n divides a minus b. So if the difference of two numbers is divided or divisible by another integer which is greater than or equal to 2, then they're equivalent in that mod. For example, 13 is congruent to 1 mod 2 because 13 minus 1 is 12 and definitely 12 is divisible by 2, right? 12 is an even number, so 2 divides 12 in other words. 8 is congruent to negative 2 mod 5 because 8 minus negative 2 is 10 and 10 is divisible by 5. Now let's look at the second thing here, which is more interesting because it contains a variable and this could be like an equation, right? So, or part of an equation. So 3x plus 7. So one of the things we use is a division algorithm. So we can basically factor the 3 out, leaving a 1 on the outside. So we can write this expression as 3 times the quantity x plus 2 plus 1, and it is congruent to 1 mod 3. Because this is basically a multiple of 3, in other words, it's 0 mod 3. Therefore, we leave a remainder of 1. So modular arithmetic basically deals with remainders. And you can look at an equation from the remainder's perspective, uh, which really helps you reduce the number of solutions. Okay, cool. The second technique that I'd like to talk about, and this is by no means a comprehensive uh, review or study of Diophantine equations. I'm just going to try to illustrate a couple techniques here and then show you some examples that I picked. So factoring is obviously a very powerful tool and there are many ways you can factor an expression and there are certain identities that you can use. For example, perfect powers, the binomial theorem, a plus b squared, a plus b cubed, so on and so forth, and minus two. Difference of two squares, very common, extremely common, and sometimes it's not very clear that you are dealing with difference of two squares. For example, when we have something like this, we're actually turning this into a difference of two squares to be able to factor it. So it's not always very obvious, but you should always look for it. Difference in sum of two powers. The most common ones are the sum of cubes and difference of two cubes. Again, those are very, very common formulas. And the Sophie Germain is also interesting because in general, a to the power n plus b to the power n is not factorable if n is even, in this case that you can't really factor it, but there are some ex uh, exceptions, of course. For example, in the case of Sophie Germain, this is factorable. Okay? Cool. You can definitely look more into this, and I'm also going to include some links in the description down below so that you can study these further. Okay. Our third technique is inequalities. Now, what does inequalities have to do with equations, right? Well, don't underestimate the power of inequalities because they're used a lot in solving equations. They give us boundaries, right? You can safely say that sometimes, you know, x or y needs to be less than or equal to a certain number or greater than or equal to a certain number, especially if you're looking for positive solutions. If you can find an upper bound and that upper bound is real small, then you're only dealing with a really small set of numbers. But 
Here are some, um, you know, bullet points about inequalities. Obviously, again, this is not comprehensive, but I just wanted to give you some ideas about uh, the stuff that's being used very often. For example, if you have an inequality like A is less than or equal to B, if you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, the inequality is reversed. Or if you have two positive numbers and A is greater than B, when you flip them, uh, the reciprocals are going to be reversed. And the third one basically talks about a perfect square because uh, a squared plus b squared minus 2ab is equivalent to a minus b quantity squared, and of course, it cannot be negative, okay? If you're dealing with real numbers, of course. We're always talking about real numbers here. And the last one is very, very important. It's called AMGM inequality, and it basically tells you that if you have a bunch of numbers, n numbers, two numbers, three numbers, doesn't matter, their arithmetic mean or average is always greater than or equal to their geometric mean. And the proof of this is fairly interesting. With the case of two or three, there are some very easy proofs. In the general case, you can use mathematical induction and so on and so forth. Okay, so our last method that I would like to present today is inequalities, and we'll use these. So as we go through these problems, as we go through the problems, kind of take notes and pay attention to which strategies are being used and how those strategies are being used. So here's the problems. Okay, now problem number one. I wanted to make this problem a linear Diophantine equation because first of all, linear Diophantine equations are fairly easy to solve. Their solution methods are pretty standard and they use, or they can use, modular arithmetic, which is one of my favorite methods in number theory. Okay, cool. So what am I gonna do here? Well, if we have an equation, we're gonna turn this into a congruent statement in a certain mod. What is that supposed to mean? Well, I'm just gonna look at this equation from the perspective of mod 23. So I'm basically gonna be looking at the remainders. What would happen if I divided both sides by 23? What would be the remainders? Since this equality is satisfied, or if it is satisfied, then it should also be satisfied in mod 23. So without further ado, mod 23, this equation should give me, basically 23 is a multiple of 23, so it would give me zero, and 29 in mod 23 is gonna be six, so I should be getting something like six y from the left-hand side, and of course I can't write the equal sign anymore, but I should write equivalent to or congruent to one, and I have to put the mod there, so I, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, now what is this supposed to mean? Well, we don't have fractions in modular arithmetic, but what we have is inverses. Every number has an inverse, does it? Always? No, not necessarily, not in every mod, but 23 is a prime number, it's a good number, so we have an inverse. So the idea here is we have to get rid of the six, so we have to make it one. How do you make it one? If you multiply six by its inverse, which is, I guess you can call multiplicative inverse, not reciprocal, but multiplicative inverse, then you'll get one. But what is the multiplicative inverse? In this case, it's four. Why? Because four times six is congruent to one mod 23. And why? Because four times six is equal to 24, which is congruent to one mod 23. So I'm gonna go ahead and multiply both sides by four. And as you know, if you have a congruent statement, you can always multiply both sides by any number you wish. Division is tricky, you can't always do it. There are some limitations, but multiplication is always fine. You can raise it to the same power, you can multiply, you can add, subtract, division is different. So four times six basically in mod 23, again, I'm thinking everything in terms of mod 23 is gonna be one, so I get y from here. So in other words, y is congruent to four mod 23. Now, what is this supposed to mean? It means that when y as an integer, and there are infinite many integers that satisfy this, of course, when y is divided by 23, the remainder will be four all the time. That's what these numbers have in common. So I can basically write y as four plus 23k, where k is an integer. Okay, cool. So this is my expression for y. So I can just go ahead and plug this in. See how powerful this is? I got an expression for parametric solution for y. I can go ahead and plug it into the equation and get something for x. Well, it's not super easy, but it's kind of fun to do. So let's go ahead and do that. So our next step is gonna be solving for x. So let's go ahead and plug in y here. So I'm gonna replace y with four plus 23k here, and I'm gonna try to solve for x. Again, this is an equation. It's not a congruent statement anymore. So I gotta be able to find x equals something, something k. Okay, just like this one. So I was able to get y, I should be able to get x as well. Okay, cool. Now, how am I gonna do this? Well, I'm gonna go ahead and expand, but I'd like to, 
isolate x, okay? Because since I'm solving for x, doesn't it make sense? So let's go ahead and write it this way. 1 minus 29 times 4 minus 29 times 23k. So x is pretty much isolated. Don't divide by 23 yet because the right-hand side is not very nice right now, but we'll make it nicer. Okay, how? By manipulating these numbers. Don't you love manipulations? Like algebraic manipulations are so much fun. Okay, let's see how, what we can do here. First of all, uh, the step that I'd like to take. First of all, this is a multiple of 23. So it's divisible by 23. But 1 minus 29 times 4 is not. Now, here's one thing you can do. You can calculate this number. 29 times 4 is 116. Subtract 1 from it, 115. So it's negative 115. Should we do that? Okay, you can do it. Let's do it. Another method would be, I would write this as 23 plus 6. And then distribute, and from there I'll get 1 minus 6 times 24, which is 1 minus 24, which is equal to negative 23, so on and so forth. But anyways, we can do it this way too. Whatever. Negative 115 minus 29 times 23k. So now both sides are divisible by 23, obviously. It should be all the time. And if you divide uh, 115 by 23, it should be negative 5, negative, I mean. And this should give us negative 29k. And that's our solution for what? For x. So we got all the solutions. Isn't that beautiful? So, well, so what is that supposed to mean? Well, you can write this as an ordered pair, basically. When k is an integer, when k is an integer, this should basically give you the solutions, all the solutions as an ordered pair, because as k runs through all the integers, you're going to get infinitely many. If you want particular solutions, for example, just one is good, then replace k with 0, and you'll get the ordered pair negative 5, comma 4, which is one of the solutions of this Diophantine equation. Another method for this problem would be using the Euclidean algorithm, because you know that we can find the greatest common divisor of two numbers using that, and then Bezot said that we can express the greatest common divisor of two numbers as a linear combination of those numbers. In this case, the greatest common divisor of 23 and 29 would be 1, which gives us the original problem, right? So that also verifies Bezos' theorem, or lemma. Some people call that lemma. Okay, here's our second problem. Now, in the first problem, we use the modular arithmetic. In the second problem, we're going to use a different strategy. Okay, so first of all, notice that this expression is kind of algebraic, so you could probably say that we're going to use some factoring. Well, can we just factor this? Uh, not as is, so I'm going to go ahead and expand it. So let's go ahead and expand it. It's going to look like, um, I think I'm fine with that color, right? Okay, I could probably stay. x squared, y squared minus 14xy plus 49. Okay, cool. That's the left-hand side, and the right-hand side is simply x squared plus y squared. Okay, now what am I going to do from here? Well, I got to manipulate this expression i got to manipulate this expression in such a way that I do have a perfect square on both sides. Is that possible? Hmm. What is that supposed to mean? Well, sort of. If I can get two perfect squares, like perfect squares on either side, with some number leftovers, then I can use difference of two squares. So that's the trick. Okay, so what is the right-hand side calling for? Look at it carefully. Look very hard. x squared plus y squared. Isn't that calling for something like plus 2xy or minus 2xy? Yes, that's right. Plus 2xy is going to work better. Let's go ahead and do it. So I'm going to add, I'm going to add four, uh, 2xy to both sides. Now, why am I doing that? Because I want to make both sides perfect squares. Now, here's the question. Am I able to make the left-hand side a perfect square? Yes. Why? Because when you simplify this, you're still going to get an even number, so you should be good. Let's proceed. This should give me negative 12xy. Now, how do you complete the square? Remember, half of 12 squared is going to give you 36, so I do actually need a 36 here. I don't need a 49. That's okay. We have a leftover. We can write it like this, plus 13. Does that make sense? And the right-hand side is x plus y quantity squared. And this is a perfect square. You get the idea? Okay, so this is xy minus 6 squared plus 13, and this is x plus y quantity squared. Now, what I can do is I can basically put these squares on the same side, x plus y squared minus xy minus 6 quantity squared is equal to 13. Now, I do have difference of two squares, okay? Didn't I tell you that's super important? Yes. So what this means is that I can basically factor this into x plus y plus xy minus 6 times x plus y minus xy plus 6 because of the negation, right? 
is equal to 13. And then you're going to be looking at cases, but there's not going to be that many cases. And I'm going to leave the rest to you guys to work out because, again, I don't want to make this video way too long, but I think the rest is kind of easy. I'll just show you the first part. So 13 is a prime number. Therefore, it can be factored as 13 and 1. That's one of the ways. You can do 1 and 13. You can do negative 13 and negative 1, negative 1 and negative 13. So there are basically four ways to factor it. And each one is going to give you a solution. Why don't we go ahead and work out one of them? And the rest is going to be very similar. So we get this and we get that. Now, this equation might look a little scary, but don't be scared because it's fairly easy to solve. Why? Because if you just add them, if you just add these two equations, you're going to get rid of x, y, which is the product, and you're going to get the x plus y twice, and even the 6 is going to cancel out, and you're going to get the x plus y 2 times 14, which means x plus y is equal to 7. If you plug in x plus y into this, you're going to get x, y is equal to 12, right? And then... From here, you basically get a system of equations. And how do you solve that system? Fairly easy. 4 and 3 are obviously solutions, and 3 and 4. So 4, 3 and 3, 4 are basically going to satisfy this system because it's symmetrical, right? So we found one solution by just looking at the 13 and 1. Then you can look at 1 and 13, 13 and negative 1, negative 13 and negative 1, and negative 1 and negative 13. So there are four cases. I've just done one of them, but the others are very very similar. Okay, cool. And of course, you have to pay attention. Sometimes you're not going to get real solutions from a system like this when the discriminant is less than zero. Cool. Let's proceed to the third problem. Okay. Problem number three is kind of like a rational equation. These types of Diophantine equations are not very easy to solve. And I got to tell you, some of these don't even have solutions or we don't know if they have solutions. Okay, cool. Let's proceed now. So for this equation, I'm going to use I'm going to use inequalities. Is that a surprise? Well, it shouldn't be. First of all, without further ado, obviously, so one thing to keep in mind is, for example, if x, y, and z are all 1, and again, we're looking for positive integers here, so if x, y, z are 1, or at least one of them is 1, what are you going to get? So suppose x equals 1. Then you're going to get 1 over y plus 1 over z, is equal to 3 fifths minus 1, which is negative 2 fifths. But this is impossible. We're dealing with positive integers, and they're, they're, some of their reciprocals cannot be a negative quantity. So this is impossible. That means that none of these variables can be 1. So we can safely say that uh, all these variables, x, y, z, are greater than or equal to 2. But let's also assume at the same time that x is the smallest, y is the middle number, and z is the largest. Without further um, without loss, what's that word? W-L-O-G, without loss of generality, yeah, whatever, something like that. Okay, so we can safely say that this, suppose this is satisfied, okay? Now, what is that supposed to mean? Well, it means that, first of all, x is, well, they can be equal, maybe, maybe not, uh, but maybe some of them, not all three at the same time. Okay, let's put it that way. This means that x seems to be the smallest one and z is the largest. So what is that supposed to mean? Well, if all of these were x instead of y and z, so since x is the smallest one, y over, okay, since x is smaller than y, 1 over x is going to be greater than 1 over y, right? Okay, we can safely say that 1 over x is greater or equal to 1 over y. And of course, 1 over x is also greater or equal to 1 over z. And you can also say that 1 over x is greater or equal to 1 over x itself because it's, it's equal. Right, so if you go ahead and add these up, these inequalities, you're going to get 3 over x is greater or equal to 1 over x plus 1 over y plus 1 over z, which happens to be 3 over 5. Wow, that's interesting. So this inequality brings us here. Now, when you flip this, remember about the flipping thing and x is positive, when you flip, uh, the inequality is going to be reversed. So what do you say about this? Well, you can safely say that from this equation, you're going to get x is less than or equal to 5 because the 3 is going to cancel out. Come on, you can do that, right? So what is that supposed to mean? x is less than or equal to 5, so you have an upper bound. Awesome. Great. So, and we know that x needs to be greater or equal to 2, so that we can safely say that these numbers are between 2 and 5. Beautiful. So, we're going to look at it case by case. Okay, cool. What if x equals 2? What happens if x is equal to 2? 
Then, if you plug it in and subtract from 3 fifths, 3 fifths is 6 tenths minus 2, uh, 5 tenths is going to be 1 tenth. So you're going to get 1 over y plus 1 over z is equal to 1 over 10. And from here, without further ado, you can just go ahead and isolate z. z right, you can write z in terms of y, and it's going to look like this. Let me just not trouble with you, you with all the details. So what you can do at this point is you can basically replace y with certain values such that y minus 10 uh, divides 100. And then you can basically get all the possible values from here. Does that make sense? Okay. For example, y minus 10 can be 1, which means y is 11. In this case, uh, 100 divided by 10 100 divided by 1 is going to be 100, and z is going to be 110. Of course, you also have to pay attention to the fact that z is greater than or equal to y, and y is greater than or equal to x. And we assume that x is equal to 2, so 2, 11, 110 is going to give you one of the solutions. And the other solutions you can pretty much work out by replacing, you know, uh, x with certain values. Okay? I mean, y with certain values such that it divides 100, uh, y minus 10 divides 100. Okay, the next value that I'm going to be looking at is going to be x equals 3. If you assume that x is equal to 3, then we're going to be getting y, 1 over y plus 1 over z is equal to 1 over 15. And from here, you can pretty much do the same thing, isolate one of the variables and plug in some numbers that are uh, going to satisfy this. And you're going to be getting some uh, order triples like 3, 4, 60, 3, 5, 15, and then 3, 6, 10. Okay, so what if x is equal to 4? In this case, you're going to be getting something like 1 over y plus 1 over z is equal to 7 over 20. If you go ahead and plug it in and subtract it, from here we're only getting one solution, and this is kind of interesting because x and y values are equal here. They're both equal to 4. Okay, and that's possible. And finally, if x is equal to 5, we're going to be getting something like 1 over y plus 1 over z is equal to 2 over 5. And from here, you're basically going to be getting that y and z are both 5, and which means that they're all equal. I said that they can't all be equal, but I think I was wrong. We have one order triple that satisfied it. Well, I should have known about it because 1 fifth plus 1 fifth plus 1 fifth is equal to 3 fifths, right? Okay, cool. So that basically concludes this problem. Let's go on to the next problem. All right, problem number four. Now, in this problem, we have the sum of two, uh, three cubes. Mm, do we have a formula for that? Uh, yeah. But do you want to use it? Maybe, maybe not. But here's one fact that should be helpful. And we've talked about this before in other videos. Suppose these are A, B, C. What do you notice about A, B, C? A is equal to X minus Y, B is equal to Y minus Z, and C is equal to Z minus X. Now, if you go ahead and add these up, you're going to notice that everything cancels out, which means that A plus B plus C is equal to zero. So what do you know about uh, A plus B plus C being equal to zero? Well, here's what we know. If A plus B plus C is equal to zero, then we can safely say that A cubed plus B cubed plus C cubed is equal to 3ABC. How do I know that? Well, I know it because we have seen before in another video that this expression is factorable. And one of the factors is a plus b plus c. The other factor is a squared plus b squared plus c squared minus a b, a, c, b, c, whatever. We don't care about the other one, but notice that if this is zero, then this needs to be zero, which means the sum of the two cubes is going to equal three times the product. Cool. So that really simplifies our equation because now I can write it as 3abc, which means three times, three times x minus y, y minus z, and z minus x is equal to 30. Dividing both sides by 3, I should be getting something like x minus y times y minus z times z minus x being equal to 10, right? And then, so we're going to be looking at the, the solutions of this system. Now, how do you get 10 from the product of three numbers? So ABC is equal to 10, right? And we're looking for numbers that would satisfy this. So we got to get we got to get something like this, plus minus 1, plus minus 2, plus minus 5, right? So these are the numbers that I can use. Or it could be something like plus minus 1, plus minus 1, and plus minus 10. Of course, I'm talking about uh, if two of them are negative, the third one needs to be positive. They can't all be negative. They can all be positive, so on and so forth. But notice that these numbers also need to satisfy the condition that a plus b plus c is equal to 0. 
but it won't be satisfied. Why? In any combination, these numbers don't add up to zero. Therefore, we don't have any integer solutions. Or we can safely say that no solutions because we're looking for integer solutions anyways, right? Cool. And this brings us to problem number five. And in this problem, this, this problem is probably one of the hardest ones because we have the variables in the exponents. And you probably noticed that in the thumbnail, there is an equation with variables in the exponents. You probably guessed the obvious solution for that one, but these are harder to solve than the polynomial ones, obviously. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to use modular arithmetic because it's just great. And what mod should I choose? Well, it's kind of like trial and error sometimes. You just got to try different mods. But in this case, it would make sense if you pick mod 5 because that would make it 1. Okay, cool. So I'm going to be looking at this expression in mod 5. And in mod 5, they basically, I'm going to be getting 1 from here. 1 to the power of x is 1. So I should be getting y squared plus y minus 2 is congruent to 1 mod 5. What is that supposed to mean? Well, if you add 2 to both sides, this is a quadratic in mod 5, which can be easily solved if there are solutions, right? And we're going to check for those. Now, at this point, you can go ahead and do the following. You can just go ahead and plug in some numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, because those are the only remainders in mod 5, and you can go ahead and test them. Or you can use the basic fact that if y is congruent to 0, so let's go ahead and make a chart here. If y is congruent to 0, then it's, Square is going to be 0 mod 5. So this is in mod 5. If y is 1, its square is going to be 1 mod 5. It's y is 2, its square is going to be 4, which is 4 mod 5. If y is equal to 3, its square is going to be 9, which is 4 mod 5 again. If uh, y is equal to 4, which could also be written as negative 1, uh, its square is going to be 1 mod 5. Now, when you add these two quantities, notice that you're going to be getting a 5 here, which is 0 mod 5, which is a 2 mod 5 which is a 1 mod 5, which is a 2 mod 5, and which is a 0 mod 5. So you will never get 3 mod 5, which means that, again, this equation has no solutions. And this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you tomorrow with another video, and it's going to be a geometry puzzle. Take care until tomorrow. Bye-bye.